Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Pattern Breaks Facilitator Series, where I chat with a seasoned creative facilitator, and they'll take you through a pattern breaking technique for you to do in real time or when you have the time. Today's is a special event because it's our launch event, and I'm super excited to be talking with Steven Nachmanovich. And in this case, we are going to have him take us through something, and then we're going to talk a little bit about it afterwards. Now, Steven's a musician, author, artist, improviser, educator, music software creator, and facilitator of improvisation. He performs and teaches internationally as an improvisational violinist and at the intersections of performing and multimedia arts, philosophy, and ecology. He puts on workshops around the world and has made numerous appearances on radio, television, and at creative festivals. He's the author of Free Play, Improvisation in Life and art, and more recently, The Art of Is, Improvising as a Way of Life. And I had the privilege of reading Stephen's book before I met him. When I was in performing with Precipice Improv in DC, I came across Stephen's book and I loved it. I read it all like in two days. I was so excited about it. And then it, a few years later, when I was moving to Charlottesville, a mutual friend of ours suggested I look Stephen up. I did. He was so generous, invited me to come over for a conversation. We talked and I've known him now for 10 years and I'm always grateful for his friendship, wisdom, presence, and just who he is in the world. Thank you so much for joining us, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. So I know you're going to take us through a little technique right now or um, activity, and then we'll we'll start chatting. Okay, well, uh, the um, technique that I'm going to ask you to try is completely invisible. So uh, not only can you do it in the privacy of your home in your pajamas, uh, but if you're the kind of person who sits in meetings meeting rooms in a suit, um, you could do it while you're sitting in the chair in your meeting room, wearing your shoes, and no one will know. <laughs> it's very simple. Um, simply um, pick one vertebra. Any vertebra, neck, thorax, lumbar and now pick another vertebra it could be the vertebra that's next door to the one that you first picked uh, or it could be one that's far away from the one you just picked and just very simply subtly Decrease the distance between those two vertebrae on one side and increase the distance on the other side. As you know, your vertebrae are sitting there in your back with a spine sticking out the back and two spines horizontal. And just make the distance between the two microscopically smaller on one side and microscopically bigger on the other side. And now, when you feel like it, just reverse the relationship so that it's now microscopically smaller on the other side and microscopically bigger on the first side. And if you wish, you can now pick another pair of vertebrae somewhere in your back. Or you could pick some other joint, um, the joints between the phalanges of your toes. You could be wearing shoes in that formal meeting. And once again, no one will know the difference but you are now subtly altering the 
spacing of that joint and feeling the difference. So you could do this for a minute, or if you like, you can spend a much longer time and explore all your vertebrae and all your bones in your body. And of course, what you discover again in this incredibly subtle, invisible exercise is that you have wiggle room. And that's all there is to it, really. So we're so often um, limited by the constraints of the situations that we're in. And it's really wonderful to know that even at the subtle, invisible level of just slightly shifting in your chair, you have wiggle room and that it's possible to move those joints. You know, joint, we are, um, uh, um, joints are in Latin, they're arthro, whatever it is. I forget what the original word in Latin is, but you know, there are arthropods, insects and spiders uh, that are uh, many jointed creatures. Um, we get arthritis as humans or dogs or other mammals when our um, joints get stiff. Um, the same word for joint, that art or arthro or whatever it is in Latin, is the root of the word art. It's the root of the word articulation. You're able to speak up and articulate something that maybe previously you had felt stuck in. So it's wonderful to play with these joints. And uh, this takes us to so many interesting and different places, you know. Um, one of the um, great um, ideas in the 20th century from systems thinking was the law of requisite variety. Uh, the law of requisite variety says that in order to handle, if you as a living system are living within living systems and wanting to somehow handle or relate to or manipulate or I won't use the word control because that's such a problematic word but handle another system um, you recognize that 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 every system contains immense amounts of information and context and um, you have to have a greater degree of variety to handle that information. So that, for example, if you have a camera, um, of course, we now shoot with uh, electronic cameras that do this um, invisibly. But uh, for old guys like me who uh, grew up with manual cameras, um, uh, your camera has a diaphragm which you would stop down or stop up. You know, they, they call the, the stops are the different degrees of openness or closedness of the um, iris or diaphragm behind the camera lens. And even without uh, a camera, if you look at your eye in the mirror, of course, you see the pupil and you see the diaphragm of the iris and the iris is constantly uh, squeezing down or, or opening up to handle different amounts of light. So if you have a camera and you want to take photos of um, objects in three different lighting situations, 
then you have to have a lens with a diaphragm that can um, be closed up, closed or open to three different degrees. And of course, preferably many, many more than three. So uh, you have to have a system that is flexible and wiggleable to many, many degrees. So this is the law of requisite variety. Uh, the original for the original law formulated by um, uh, a man named Ross Ashby in the 1950s uh, is that variety eats variety, and in order to handle a certain amount of variety, you need more variety. And this is why diversity is so important in societies and organizations and in every aspect of our life, a diversity of points of view, a diversity of understandings, diversity of different kinds of sense organs. And we begin to learn this just from this little exercise of wiggling your vertebrae and discovering that there are so many states that your um, body can take even within the very subtle invisible level of just moving a joint a millimeter this way or a millimeter that way. Yes, oh my, uh, there are so many things you said, so much richness in what you said. First of all, I felt just after doing that simple exercise that I just naturally took a deep breath and was able to breathe easier. Mm -hmm. And it does did allow more flexibility. I will be using that as a practice. So thank you, Stephen. And it ties so much into facilitating or teaching or leading groups. And even into our own is that no matter what we think, there's always room for a shift. There's always room to for there's always space to maneuver and that structure doesn't inhibit creativity you know it can it helps it move and uh so that i was just thinking about that as you were talking how that this exercise correlates exactly what what we need to do as facilitators of creative process just open little spaces break little patterns for something new 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 energy can emerge new ideas yes and um, of course, the the exercise hasn't ended <laughs> because at the moment you and I are sitting, and um, those of you who are watching this, uh, you may well be sitting also, though you may be standing or lying down or walking or doing something else. But of course, your joints are still there and your vertebrae are still there, and they haven't stopped moving. And so it's just so um, wonderful to realize that this is something that you can do continuously at any time. It's not like, okay, here's a thing to try and now let's talk about it. Or here's the action and here's the ideas. There's no action separate from ideas and there's no ideas separate from action. One of the quotes that I have kept that you've said along those lines uh, around techniques and practices is you said, the Western idea of practice is to acquire a skill. It's very much related to your work ethic, which enjoins us to endure struggle or boredom now in return for future rewards. The Eastern idea of practice, on the other hand, is to create the person or rather actualize or reveal the complete person who is already there. Not only is the practice necessary to art, it is art. Mm. Mm, thank you for saying that. That's so important. Yeah, practice um, is such an interesting concept. Um, in the, uh, again, of course, when I say Western and Eastern there, and um, some of that some of that contrast in that quote you read from um, uh, from free play is um, 
derived from my teacher, Gregory Bateson, uh, the polymath anthropologist, philosopher, biologist, scientist of many sorts. <laughs> and uh, we do have uh, a certain stereotype of West and East that became somewhat romanticized in the 20th century. Um, uh, thinking of Western civilization as being very purpose-oriented and uh, linear and uh, goal-directed and all of that. Um, and um, of course, there are innumerable parts of Western civilization that aren't like that. And there are innumerable parts of Eastern civilization that are like our stereotype of Western civilization. And uh, for those of us who become fascinated by I, practices of Zen and Taoism and other um, Asian um, practices and philosophies, uh, of course, many of those um, practices and philosophies developed uh, at times that were ruled by uh, brutal warlords, uh, just as we see throughout the world today. Um, and um, they were developed uh, regardless of the activities of those warlords by people who felt that they had some wiggle room and that that wiggle room was vital to their survival and to their sanity. Uh, but the Western idea of practice, as you um, mentioned, um, we tend to think I'm a musician, I'm a violinist. Uh, so, of course, I grew up as a kid uh, practicing the violin and having the idea that you practice in order to be able to accomplish something later. You practice now to be able to accomplish something later. So already you're split between now and later, you're split between um, doing exercises versus playing Beethoven or Stravinsky or whatever you might want to play, uh, that there's the exercises and the real music. And that somehow you couldn't do the real music unless you did the exercises first which were um, uh, classified as boring and rote and uh, important to develop skills, but the skills were for something else. And um, this kind of split, um, I tell a story in one of the books about uh, uh, music departments have practice rooms uh, they're like uh, just little ro rows of rooms in the building um, that have a piano and are just places where students can go and close the door and practice. And um, in one of these departments, um, one of these practice rooms had been converted to someone's office. And there was a sign on the door that said, this is no longer a practice room. And somebody had scribbled underneath. Now it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so the Eastern idea of practice as labeled according to that um, caricature of Eastern and Western culture is um, that the act itself, the practice is the act itself. Uh, people in Zen Buddhism and other kinds of contemplative practices. Um, it's not like you're sitting in order to become a better person or to get enlightened or to, you know, accomplish something. That the sitting is of itself and it's for itself. And you're being a Buddha as you sit. And um, if you look at the Zen literature, um, you see the word practice used in this way, you know, sitting still on a cushion is called practice. And when I was younger, I knew about this use of the word practice, 
uh, but one day somebody, um, uh, a young American Zen priest, uh, used the word practice in this way, which I'd heard many times before, and suddenly it kind of zinged right into the um, whatever this organ is, the brain. <laughs> <laughs> the brain <laughs> and i i realized well gee i'm a musician and i've spent uh countless hours practicing and i know what practice is now mm. you know practice is the doing as my my very dear friend rachel rosenthal you know, a great um improvisational theater artist and performance artist uh called her practice and the workshops that she led uh do by doing dvd i love that that is so true with improv you know yeah. it is not about the performing or, or i remember that for me and for many people it's not about the performing getting to where you can perform although that in itself is a joyful experience but just the act of showing up and improvising and doing the games or not the games or just being present and improvising. And some of the best improvisations that I've experienced have ha just happened outside of an improv uh, s a situation, you know, people building on each other and yes, anding. and it, it's uh, improv. The improvisation allows us to be in the practice and be in the aliveness and be in the art and be in out of the practice at the same time. Yes. Yes. And so in that way, improvisation um, eliminates, there is really no difference between improvising and composing. Mm. It's a continuum. And, um, you engage with the practice, let's say you are a writer and you scribble something that feels wonderful. And that's an improvisational process. And then the next day you look at it and you go, oh, well, this was not so hot. I need to move this around and delete that and move something else in here and so on. Um, and that's an improvisational process too. So erasing and deleting are improvisational processes. Editing is an improvisational process. And um, they can be undertaken with a mood of regret or shame or something like that. Like, oh my God, I, I did something terrible and I must erase it. <laughs> or they can be done with an attitude of, God, here's another wonderful phase to the creative process of life, which is deleting and cutting out and moving and criticizing and mm -hmm. all of that. Discerning. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I yeah. love it. Well, it's, yeah. that segues into actually another quote that I had exactly saved from you. It said um, how bronze once a bronze Brahms once remarked that the mark of an artist is how much he throws away. Nature, the great creator, is always throwing things away. Frog mm. lays several million eggs at a sitting. Only a few dozen of those become tadpoles, and only a few of those become frogs. We can let imagination and practice to be as profligate as nature. Yes. I love that quote. Yes, yes, and yes. And I feel it ties into what you're saying. Um, it's not about, you know, it, it helps get people out of the, also the binary thinking of right, wrong, good, bad, success, failure. You know, mm -hmm. that, well, if, if I have to put this out, it has to be this one way, or I try this activity, or I do this design, or I try this creative process, and it has to, it either works or doesn't work. Instead of trying it, putting more out there, refining, adapting, improvising along the way, yes. through, choosing what to discern, discard, choosing what to build on, choosing what to say yes to, what to say no to, what to maybe, you know, it's, it's instead of it being so uh, binary and polarizing, it's, it's becomes multi-dimensional improvisation. Yes. Creative process. 
Yes. And then what you what you said about um, the frog's eggs, Michelle, uh, and again, this it still <laughs> continues to, what I said, what I said that you said that I said that yeah. you said, um, <laughs> volleying back and forth is, um, and, and it relates, of course, still we are sitting in our seats here, gently wiggling our vertebrae back and forth and picking new pairs of vertebrae and exploring their um, ranges of motion. Um, I talked about, um, there's an article that I wrote 54 years ago about play uh, in, uh, I was studying play in children and in baby baboons. <clears throat> and it was called Ends, Means, and Galumphing, some light motifs of play. And galumphing, which of course is a word I stole from Lewis Carroll in Jabberwocky. Um, I, I was referring to that, you know, you watch puppies play or little children play, and there's this exaggerated, inefficient, all over the place motion that is going on all the time, and they're just spending energy like crazy, and they aren't conserving, they aren't optimizing, they're, you know, <laughs> they're just all over the place. And um, galumphing, you know, to be able to write something down, whether it's a business plan or a poem, and keep shifting things around and erase and correct and throw it away and toss it in the wastebasket and start over and do some more playing with it. Um, I mean, that's one of the essences of creative work and creative life. And I was thinking about that a lot during the pandemic, because I remember especially um, in, okay, I'm showing my age now, because I was about to say 1920, but <laughs> I meant, I meant 2020. <laughs> I, in 2020, um, when the pandemic first started and we were all really isolated. Um, and one of the um, features of the pandemic when everybody compassionately, in order to take care of other human beings, closed things down, closed schools down, closed businesses down, restricted travel, did all of those things is that you know we suddenly became aware of all these supply chain problems in the economy that um, many companies um, in the years prior to the pandemic decided that they didn't want to spend the effort and money to warehouse parts, auto parts, or whatever the parts may be, auto parts, computer parts, whatever. Um, because uh, that um, uh, that is less efficient. They thought that was less efficient than uh, shipping things in real time uh, across the ocean in container ships and um, expe expecting that everything can be manufactured just in time with no wiggle room. So this whole kind of just-in-time economy that we developed over a couple of decades prior to the pandemic uh, suddenly revealed that it didn't work at all when there was a disruption and the ships couldn't move and the um, trucks couldn't move and so forth. And um, I was thinking back to um, what is probably the heyday of American capitalism uh, which was the in the 1960s, um, the NASA space program. And um, this was a government program, but it was made with things that were manufactured by thousands and thousands of companies. And they had the thing that made that program work so heroically 
was that they had backups and backups for the backups and backups for the backups for the backups and so on. So there was no shortage of spare parts. And they could decide something isn't working, we're going to slip something else in here. And so there was a kind of profligacy that was possible again, which in a weird way is similar to galumphing. It means that you have energy to spare, you have things to spare, you have the you have flexibility to spare so that then you can deal with problems. And they had relatively few problems for something that was so immense and complex at the time. Uh, whereas now, you know, uh, one little bolt that's missing um, from some piece of machinery, if it's not available at the hardware store, you're stuck until the hardware store gets its supply in again, because everything is so tight. Um, a whole airline system goes to a complete halt uh, because there are no spare planes sitting in the hangars. There are no spare employees who can be um, put online when somebody gets sick in the system and so forth. So, you know, this idea of galumphing, which is a sort of silly idea that has to do with play and puppies bouncing around, it actually refers to also the law of requisite variety and the fact of having wiggle room mm -hmm. and the possibility of adjusting mm -hmm because you are alive and you are profligate like the frogs and the frogs eggs and therefore you can move around so this the ability to wiggle is so important and when we are efficient you know galumping galumping is the opposite of efficiency and our society we have come to um, uh, worship efficiency and doing things in the most parsimonious way with the least amount of resources. And that's great when everything is rolling along as planned, but when everything is not rolling along as planned, the whole system seizes up and you're stuck. So in fact, having play in the system, you know, I wrote about my first book is called Free Play and uh, it refers not just to improvisation and creativity and music, but you know, back to our little exercise here, you know, there's the play in your joints, my fingers, the two joints of my finger, <clears throat> the three joints can move <laughs> this way, but they can't move very far this way. Okay, so they have, so there's the engineering meaning of the word free play that has to do with how many degrees of freedom does a joint have to move or be constrained from moving? Right. You know, there's, it's reminds me to a lot of um, <clears throat> what improv and other, any kind of pattern breaking whole brain sort of practices help us do. One, all of the things we were talking about before, but be able to in low stakes environments, um, in in places where emotionally we're not afraid, so we we are just have more of that um, expansion in our emotional system. Like we're not contracting out of fear. We're playing, and sometimes in these low stakes environments, when we do improv or galump and and open and explore, then it really is a hot, prepares us for high stakes changes where things come on to us or if we're too rigid or too stuck it because we're less flexible and adaptable when life really throws us challenges like you were talking about as opposed to developing systems within ourselves and developing our teams leaders systems structures that have kind of that the lumping in them to be able to respond and adapt when real world challenges happen instead of shut down or freeze or fight, flight, for you know, go into a trauma response. And so, so much of what you're talking about ties into 
just these little little tiny pattern breaks like what you were just saying creating space in the joints playing with them creating doing something different improvising you know looking at the world differently it's the funny thing is it's easier i think once you embrace that mindset it's easier to not to explore and find something new every day all the time than it is to stay stuck in our pattern once we kind of cross over into the mindset of valuing that and honoring that instead of staying what's most efficient what's the quickest what's the you know what do i always do and and ultimately becomes both and you know structure and flow yes yes and the third thing to go back we've had we had the the wiggling of the vertebrae which led to the law of requisite variety and to galumphing and the third element that comes out of that same um, wiggling process that we've been talking about is that wiggling is always um, bi-directional and um, around optimal values. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, in biology, there is... Um, an optimal blood temperature. There's an optimal level of blood sugar. And our bodies are constantly, um, without our conscious interference, wiggling around. Your body temperature doesn't stay the same. It's constantly wiggling around a set of values that are always changing, um, but they're, they're, the system is always um maneuvering itself so that it stays within a certain range until you get sick and get a fever and your blood sugar the same and oxygen the same you know oxygen is of course very good for us as animals but if we walked into a room with 40 percent oxygen then we would immediately incinerate so ox oxygen is really good for you up to a point and we have um we are biological beings and uh we have imagined something called the economy which is also biological it's a it's a biological synthesis of the activity of lots of human beings um but uh in biology there is no value that's um that can be increased forever and yet there's certain things that we want to maximize you know like money somehow it's thought that you know if you have ten dollars it's better to have twenty dollars which i'm sure is absolutely true but if you have ten billion dollars do you really need twenty billion dollars uh, but um uh, when we attach uh value to things that we want to maximize forever you know uh i'm a parent and when my uh two adult sons were two years old uh it was fantastic to watch them grow of course and all parents have you know made the little marks on the door sill you know of oh he grew an inch in the last six months and isn't that fantastic but you don't want your uh, 30 year old child to be 60 feet tall and so as we wiggle our vertebrae back and forth we also get to think about how the wiggling is back and forth any form any healthy form of existence is going to reach certain values and then reverse and then reach certain values and then reverse and go left and right and left and right and so forth like the foot before and the foot behind and walking mm -hmm. and uh, we get so stuck in want wanting to maximize certain things or minimize other things that uh, 
end up affecting the survivability of ourselves and our planet and our fellow human beings. So there's a lot of things that are, a lot of ideas that are resident in this simple wiggling of your vertebrae. Absolutely, including, you know, the dynamic balance that you're talking about, where, you know, everything in nature does have some kind of dynamic balance to create something, you know, or to provide life, the, the back and forth, the, the inhale, exhale, the ebb and flow of the tides, you know, yeah. uh, things work in that balance where if it gets too out of balance, then it, it can be detrimental for the system but it needs some of that movement or that little back and forth to generate life, to create, uh, to generate creativity, to generate aliveness. So I really appreciate what you're saying about that. It's, uh, it's so much embedded in who we are as nature beings and creative beings. Yeah. Well, I have another quote I would love to explore as our final one of today, if you would be open for that, because I think it so relates to anybody, uh, well, all of us as individuals, and certainly anyone that would ever teach or lead or facilitate creative process. And it is about silence, because that is often feared. Mm -hmm or often mm -hmm. uncomfortable for many people. So this is what you said. You said, in the art of teaching, we recognize that ideas and insights need to cook over a period of time. Sometimes the one who is the least articulate about expressing the ideas is in fact, the one who is absorbing and processing them most deeply. This applies as well to our own private learning of our art form. The areas in which we feel most stuck and most incompetent may be our richest goal mine of developing material. The use of silence and teaching then becomes very powerful. Mm. Could you speak a little bit about the use of silence and teaching for mm. those, especially for anyone who might have a story in them going, oh, I tried this and then crickets. You know, uh, I, I feel silence is, is often incubating time in my experience. And I'd love to hear what your thoughts mm. are. Yes, there's so many. Um, and of course, we're going to use the word teaching very broadly yeah. to cover a lot of things that people do that aren't necessarily taking place in schools. Um, one of the unfortunate um, features of our current society is the desire to have everything planned. And of course, then things don't happen. Things happen that aren't planned and we don't know how to deal with them. Um, in the teaching world, um, when I was, uh, I hadn't been officially teaching classes in an institution since the 1970s. Um, and now when I teach, of course, I'm traveling around and I'm the guest and I can sort of do what I want. So I have this great privilege. Um, but now one is expected, whether one is teaching kindergarten or graduate school, um, one is expected to have a syllabus planned out in which everything that's going to happen week by week by week is planned out what the people will read, what they'll do, how they'll be evaluated and assessed and da, 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 da. And uh, so much of the culture is run on a mania for assessment. And you have to know in advance what you're going to be assessed on. And therefore the chances of any real learning get minimized. Now, um, when I was teaching back in the 70s, it was still feasible to um, have a class and there might be a list of books that 
we would read over the coming semester, but we'd have a class, people would talk with each other, we would think together and discover together. And then I could say, well, based on what we just said, let's read this for next week. And there would be no predicting what this would be from the choices that were available. Um, my teacher, Gregory Bateson, uh, there's a, a story that I've told about him many times where um, I was his teaching assistant um, for a couple of years in Santa Cruz. And uh, we were in this seminar setting and I forgot what was being discussed, but I was like this young whippersnapper in my early 20s and I knew a lot of stuff and I just jumped in and went blah, 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 blah. And um, I was so smart and I knew so many things and I was sparking the fireworks and da, 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 da. And uh, then the class ended and everybody left and Gregory stood up next to me. He was very, very tall, tall, elderly, uh, shaggy English gentleman. And he poked me and he said, I had a nice juicy silence cooking in there and you had to stick your big feet in and muck it up. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, so even just now, when you were um, asking me the question about silence, Okay, obviously, uh, one of the answers to your question is for the two of us to sit here and enjoy the silence. And I know, of course, an audience will be listening to this later. And so it's like um, in teaching, you know, you're teaching at a college and the students are paying some ungodly tuition and going into horrendous debt and so forth, or the parents are paying for them. And so you, the teacher, are under unconscious pressure all the time to um, give them uh, their money's worth. And uh, so you have to like keep talking and doing and have activities and have assessments and have all this stuff. Whereas to just ask a question and have it sit there hanging in the air for a while. And allow the people to be there with that probably unanswerable question is absolutely wonderful. And it's out of that silence that education sometimes happens. To not have the answers, because for God's sakes, we are living in a world in the year 2024, where um, nobody has the answers. And people who claim to have the answers are full of baloney. So Sometimes it's good to just sit and feel your vertebrae cycling around in those small ranges of motion and be aware of the complexity of your body and the complexity 
of the world in which you live without popping up with an answer. You know, when you were speaking to that, I noticed my eyes started watering because it that emergent space, I call it emergent space, you know, where there isn't answers. It's 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 a space that something can emerge is so trampled on or pushed over or not valued mm. uh, in our society. Mm -hmm. And we don't give enough of it. I know it, it's the place where new ideas, new new inner guidance, new directions can emerge. It's the place where we can create in unexpected ways. It's the place where we can make connections or it's the place where we can just sit and be in empty space without any agenda or direction. And as you were speaking to it, you know, everything in me just feels it so delicious and and feels that dynamic tension between in my own work of wanting to stay in that more when I'm facilitating and you know in my own life I I try to give myself more emergent space and sometimes I'm do and sometimes I don't but when I'm facilitating and that you know acknowledgement of well we also have some objectives and agenda you know so I try to create a more dynamic agenda where there's certain things of the objectives but room and space in the agenda to you know for the unexpected and just hold you know being able to hold more of that emergent space in our days in our lives for all of us that would be imagine how transformative that would be mm -hmm. thank you for bringing that here Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we've just about done it. We have. <laughs> On that note, I want to thank you so much, Stephen. It's been, you know, we we had no idea at all what yeah. we were going to talk about. We just said, let's just follow the conversation. And I appreciate it. And thank you for the beautiful, powerful practice of the the joints and uh can you let people know if they want to learn more about your books or your work or you where is the best place to find you uh the best place to find me is freeplay.com fantastic okay and then they'll Very find easy. links to your books there if they to my books there okay. uh my most recent book is called the art of is do you want to share a sentence or two about what that is about? I want to share a sentence or two about what it is. What is it? It is um, the social interactive dimensions of the creative process. It's about interbeing, Thich Nhat Hanh's word. It's about Ubuntu, the South African word. It is about um, what we learn from being together in the context of this world. So everyone go check out freeplay.com. And if you would like some more pattern breaking techniques, this is my book, Pattern Breaks, and where I share practices, principles, philosophies, processes to help break patterns in your design and your facilitation, as well as in yourself, because it's much easier for us to facilitate creative process if we have access to more of ourselves as a creative facilitator. I look forward to seeing you next time on another video. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Michelle. Take thank care. You, Stephen.